So good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, obviously my name is Joe. And, and part of the reason that I'm standing here right now is that I am a recovering Lutheran pastor. And I mean that in a, a few different ways. In one sense, there's a part of me that is still a pastor that deeply values elements of the Lutheran tradition. And I am recovering from the way I lived before relentless love captivated me. If you heard me preach my story here at the sanctuary a couple years ago or came to my session on addiction and relentless love at our last conference, you know the details. If not, and you're curious, they are readily available online. In another sense, I am someone who is deeply pastoral in how I approach all of life, who is recovering from the effects of Lutheranism on my soul. I would say that I grew up in a faith that amplified shame while dismissing guilt. But since God has invited me to a place where faith disempowers shame and invites guilt to be a teacher. And yet in a third way, I am recovering from being a Lutheran pastor. For years, I preached and taught from a place that I no longer agree with. I did this as a youth pastor, a church planter, and in a congregational setting. I'm learning to live a life of pastoral amends and remain hopeful that what I preach today might bring some healing to wounds that I created years ago. So there you have it. Three words. Recovering. Lutheran. Pastor each with their own meaning, but in order to make sense of them in my life, you need to look at the in-between. You need to understand the relationship to each other. I would say the same thing is true of God as revealed in the Bible. But you wouldn't guess that from how we typically talk about God. Today is Trinity Sunday. Now, I realize, I was talking to Peter a little bit earlier, and I, I realized that, you know, some of those folks, like, if you're coming from an evangelical strain somewhere, and I say Trinity Sunday, you might look at me and go like, what's that? However, there's, there's this entire section within, within Catholicism and mainline Protestantism that has this thing called a lectionary, where they set up texts and festivals and feasts and celebrations throughout the year, and, and, and they say, these are things that you, you do and you preach on on any given Sunday. And, and today happens to be a day where churches throughout Western Christendom celebrate God's triune nature. What does it mean for God to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, or Thought, and Word, and Breath, or Nursing Mother, Mother, Hen, and Comforter? More often than not, I have found myself trying to avoid conversations about the Trinity because the whole three-in-one thing just seems confusing and nonsensical. I feel a bit like the Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant, who once said, absolutely nothing worthwhile for the practical life can be made out of the doctrine of the Trinity taken literally. But I don't think that's God's fault. Instead, I think the problem might be how we engage in our God talk. One of the more challenging books I read in seminary was Catherine Lacuna's God for Us, the Trinity, and the Christian Life. If you don't want the heavy-weighted, academic-y version of that book, um, which Lacuna wrote, I would suggest that you pick up Richard Rohr's The Divine Dance. Lacuna opens saying there are two ways to engage in God talk. The first is talking about God. The second is telling God's story. 
You and I are most familiar with talking about God because talking about things is what we do in the Western world. But the Bible, the early church, and traditions stemming from Eastern Orthodoxy focus on telling God's story because that is what people in the Near East do. What do I mean? How is, is Greek or Hellenistic thought, which the Greeks pass on to the Romans and gave to the rest of the Western civilization, different from Semitic thought processes that shaped Judaism? This chart will offer a few differences. So if you notice that first one on the explanation of form versus the explanation of function, let me, let me offer you an example. This past Monday evening, I had a flight from Chicago to Denver. I was supposed to take off at 9.30 Central. It was after 10 when I got on the plane. Turbulence tossed the plane around the sky on takeoff, and despite the captain's expectations, continued to mess with the plane throughout the flight. Then, when we landed in Denver more than an hour later than expected, no gates were open and available because departing flights were waiting for a single refueling truck to get ready to fill them up so they could go. And so we sat on the plane for another half hour just waiting to get to a gate. Now, in the West, most of us would call that a rough flight. After all, the form of the flight included all kinds of delays and discomforts. However, for a Semitic mind which focuses on the function, while well, not ignoring the inconveniences, would make a final assessment of the flight and then say, you got from Chicago to Denver, so it was a good flight. In our world, the quality of the flight comes first, but for them, the key question is not whether the flight, it was whether the flight accomplished the intended purpose. As another example, when we in the West talk about heaven and hell, we often associate heaven as good and, or heaven and earth, I'm sorry, heaven and earth, we, we often associate heaven as good and earth as bad. And so the idea in a lot of Western Christianity is trying to figure out how to escape earth and get to heaven. But in the Semitic mind, Heaven and earth references the whole of the creation, none of which is inherently bad. The problem is on earth is that we don't live under the rule and reign of God. So rather than escaping earth to get to heaven, the call is to bring heaven to earth by believing the gospel. That phrase, believing the gospel, brings us to yet another example. In the West, belief is about intellectual assent. But in the East, belief is about how faith shapes the way you live. A clear example of this that brings us back to the Trinity centers on what I remember most about Trinity Sunday growing up. It was the one Sunday of the church year when we would profess in unison all 745 words of the Athanasian Creed. For those of you who aren't familiar with the church history, let me offer a brief recap of Athanasius and the creed named after him. As Christianity expanded from the Semitic to the Hellenistic world, debates arose over how to talk about the persons of the Trinity. One of the most well-known teachers of the day, a man named Arius, taught that Jesus was similar to God. But this caused problems because being similar to God does not mean being the same as God. So at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the central question was whether Jesus was homoousius, one substance with God, or homoousius, similar substance with God. Athanasius, nicknamed the Black Dwarf, was the third century bishop in Alexandria who is credited as leading the one substance movement. 
His detailed articulation of Jesus, which he writes about in his book on the Incarnation, played a central role in the conclusion that Jesus was homoousius with God. But why was substance, the substance of Jesus such a huge deal for the Western mind? Well, 300 years before Jesus, a Greek philosopher named Aristotle lived and died. And he taught that there were 10 different qualities to a thing. Eight of those have English equivalents. We're going to pop up a little courtesy of Michael Hanna Designs. The eight English equivalent qualities. And you'll notice that two of those in there are kind, what is a thing, and relation. How does it relate to other things? Now, for Aristotle, kind, what is a thing, what is its substance, was the most important quality about a thing. So if you want to believe the gospel then you better correctly understand the substance of Jesus. So that is what the vast majority of the Athanasian Creed centers on. And you can see it is quite the creed. In just a moment, it's coming. There we go. Yes, we used to stand up on Trinity Sunday and say this word for word the whole way through. As you can sort of see here, it begins, whoever wants to be saved should above all cling to the Catholic faith. Whoever does not guard it whole and inviolable will doubtlessly perish eternally. Heartwarming, isn't it? And deeply troubling given that salvation suddenly depends on correctly embracing the highly cerebral breakdown of the Catholic faith that follows. If we scroll through the text of that creed, if you could actually read it, if we could blow it up, you would notice there are lines like, Thus, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. And thus, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, and yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. It isn't until the last nine of the 43 lines of the creed that it even begins to discuss the activity of God. And two of those lines close everything out saying, this is the Catholic faith. One cannot be saved without firmly, without believing this firmly and faithfully. Yet, what human being ever has read a breakdown of the substance of the three persons of the Trinity and said, That's it! I get it now! I'm a beloved child of God! In fact, I'm guessing more than one of you right now is bored out of your mind as I try to lay out why the way we talk about the Trinity bores us out of our minds. And all these debates didn't end at Nicaea. Instead, it set the stage for hundreds of years of talking about God. Nicaea fueled the kinds of conversations that led to diagrams like this one. Oh, not that one. Should be the the blocky one. The the hand sketch. There we go. That's the one. So we have the Father is not the Son and is not the Holy Spirit and is not the Father, but they all... And defending the blessed Trinity. Now I'm glad that the the creator of this, this image is out to defend the sacred Trinity... But a huge part of me has to think, so what? 
No wonder talk about the Trinity on Trinity Sunday, D-A-Y, quickly becomes, comes a Trinity Sundays, D-A-Z-E. I mean, even if we tried to make this more entertaining, if I said, let's, let's get into the, the, the human and divine natures of Jesus, and, and I'm going to bring Peter up here, and we're going to step into a steel cage and have a wrestling match to determine once and for all whether the gainus myosoticum is reciprocal or not, which would allow us to make a final determination as to whether the, the bread and wine is, as Calvin says, merely a symbol of the body and blood of Jesus, or as Luther says, the real presence in, with, and under the bread and wine. And yet, once again, it might be more entertaining, but nobody, anytime, anywhere, has ever had their eyes open to the relentless love of God through a steel cage match or over the gainus myosoticum, whether it is reciprocal or not. So, how can we actually preach the Trinity? When I say that, I mean, how do we talk about the Trinity in a way that doesn't feel like some strange newfangled math where three are really one or we get into hyper-detailed discussions about heady concepts that are, that are not irrelevant but do nothing to bring us to a place where we're consumed by divine love? This is where Catherine Lacuna points east and tells us to stop talking about God and start telling God's story. It is also where Richard Rohr invites us to stop starting with the one and explaining how they are three, and instead begin with the three and unpack how they are one. And when we do this, our picture of the Trinity changes from something like this to something like that. On the left, you have God the Father. But Father here is not a reference to maleness, as if God, who, is, so, who self-describes in Genesis 1 as both male and female, is now suddenly limited to only the masculine. Moreover, it isn't about biology as the Son is co-eternal with the Father. Rather, this is entirely about a relationship dynamic between a parent and a child. But what does that dynamic look like? Four and a half years ago, my kiddo came home with a flyer for a school-sponsored ski day which included a lesson for beginners. My kid knew dad used to love to ski and wanted to be a part of something that mattered to me and expressed a desire to go. But when I picked him up at the end of a day on the slopes, tears were flowing. It had been a miserable day, filled with falling and not a lot of fun. But through the tears of frustration came the words, I want to go again. Then they made it clear that next time things would be different. They would go with me. I would be the teacher. For our first trip together, we went up to Loveland. As you might expect, we started on the bunny slope with me trying to teach nice, wide, controlled turns. I explained it as drawing S's with our skis. And instead, we got this. Nice big S's. really an S there, but <laughs> controlled. Intel. Now, 
Despite the fall at the end there, confidence was brimming. Something about my presence had enhanced boldness. Suddenly, they, they didn't come to the mountain with fear, but they came with aggression. So we went up higher on the mountain and prepared to take a long green run down to the bottom. But steeper slopes proved far more daunting. Speed picked up more quickly, and now every few hundred feet, they would crash to slow down. With each fall, I would come to their side, make sure it was only the ego that was hurt, help them up, and remind them to take wide, gentle turns. We repeated the process all the way to the bottom of the mountain. By the time we got there, there was nothing left but tears and frustration, so I suggested we break for lunch. There's something about a cup of hot chocolate that makes everything better. Except maybe in here today. After getting some food and allowing the emotions to cool, I asked, what do you think went wrong? After a pause, I didn't have control. So how do you get control? I make S's. Exactly. Want to try again? I don't remember if they even took time to answer, but on went the helmet and we were heading back outside. After one trip down the bunny slope, we returned to the top of the mountain and this happened. Nice. Great job, champ. <laughs> Now, I am by no means an expert ski instructor. But I do bring something to the table that no professional ever could. I'm dad. And when I live into the fullness of that relationship, when I embody the idea of fatherhood, it creates a sense of security and confidence for the child to step into a challenge. It stirs a desire on the part of the child to do well, to push themselves to achieve something they might not otherwise accomplish. It also means that I'm there to provide encouragement and comfort in the midst of struggle to accomplish the task at hand. Finally, there's an overwhelming joy on my part as I see them give their best effort, whatever the result. That is fathering as relationship. And so we go back to our picture of the Trinity. We can see the Father in gold looking at the Son in blue in absolute adoration. You can see the pride in those eyes. The son turns, gazes back to the father from a place of, of confidence and comfort and security, certain that he will make the father proud as he embraces his mission to reveal eternal love and adoration that exists within God from before the foundation of the world. Yes, the task is daunting. Christ, the Christ will spend 33 years on earth. There will be temptation and persecution. Friends will be made and then lost. There will be rejection, isolation, misunderstanding, and ultimately crucifixion. No wonder Jesus often went off to pray and just spend time before the Father's adoring gaze. Admiring this relational dynamic between the Father and the Son and completing the Trinitarian circle is the Spirit celebrating and participating in the love and adoration. And then, from before the foundations of the world, as the three dwell together in this perfect love, 
for one another. From before time begins, something starts to happen. Between, the energy between them takes form, and the creation itself starts coming into being. But the first thing to appear is not heaven and earth, but wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom talks and tells us about her arrival on the scene. She tells her origin story. Listen to some of what she has to say. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills, I was brought forth. What does divine love manifest? Wisdom. The undergirding order of all creation. This simple reality should radically reshape how we think about the entire book of Proverbs. If you're unfamiliar with Proverbs, it's one of five books that forms the wisdom literature in the Jewish Bible. Like Song of Solomon's and Ecclesiastes, it is attributed to King Solomon, who is the Bible I describes as the wisest man who ever lived. In it, Solomon teaches his son about two ways you can approach life. Each is given a female archetype. One involves the folly of following the seductress, and the other is the pursuit of Lady Wisdom. The question the child has to answer throughout his life is which one he will pursue. But that is not just a question that Solomon and his son faced, nor is it a question only for men. Every human has to make the choice between folly and wisdom. At some level, that sounds easy. But folly is crafty, often appearing as a wolf in sheep's clothing. It comes across as pleasurable, thoughtful. Folly feeds the ego. And who wouldn't want that? I don't know about you, but growing up, Proverbs was pitched to me as a book about doing right and avoiding wrong. In fact, I was told that there were 31 chapters in Proverbs, one for each day of the month. So if I read a chapter a day, I would consistently enforce the things I should do and remind myself of the things to avoid, and in the process, learn to live a life that was pleasing to God. Obeying Proverbs was pitched as the path to a good life, which sounds rather pleasurable, thoughtful, and if you do it well, definitely feeds the ego. Do you see how tricky folly really is? Divine wisdom does not begin with external behaviors. She's born out of divine love. She's born from living in God's in-between and is captivated and caught up in the Trinitarian belovedness. Wisdom continues to talk about her arrival in the creation in verses 27 to 29. Here we have the establishment of the heavens, a circle drawn on the face of the deep, a firmament above the skies. The limit of the sea is set, the foundation of the earth is established. Notice all of this is about creating a place that is safe and secure. It's a place designed to give those who wander in it confidence and comfort that someone is watching over them and caring for them. I remember hearing about a research project years ago involving parks near busy streets. If a playground was built in the center of the park and there was no barrier between the park and the street, then the children would limit their activity to the playground itself. Anything beyond the sand pit was deemed unsafe. But if a barrier was built around the edge of the park, something between the traffic and the kids, suddenly the entire park was fair game, and the kids would venture 
everywhere. Security gives the freedom to play. The kids could venture off and explore because they knew they were safe. They were certain that if anything were to happen, a parent would come and save the day. Can you imagine what recently born wisdom does as she watches this secure creation come into being with all of those foundations and boundaries and firmaments? Can you imagine, can you see her, her, her wandering and frolicking through creation without fear? At one moment, she finds herself on a mountaintop feeling the wind rush across the summit. Moments later, she's at the ocean listening to waves crash onto the shore. As the creation continues, she finds herself examining bugs or riding a wild horse. The point is, is that she delights in all of it and feels free to explore all of it, knowing that whatever happens, if she ever finds herself uncertain, she can simply stop, step back into God's in-between, and once again lose herself in divine love. The segment finishes out with Proverbs 8, 30 to 31. As the creation is complete, Humanity comes on the scene, and wisdom continues to do what she's been doing. One of the most challenging points of translation comes in that first line in verse 30. It's hard to know what to do with the Hebrew word that gives us master workman in the ESV. Other translators argue that it should be loving child. Perhaps the best argument given how this collection of verses flows from before the creation to the creative act to after the creation, is faithful companion. So wisdom continues to find herself caught up in the adoration between the members of the Trinity, but she also rejoices in humanity, and her life is such bliss that she wants nothing more than for you and I to participate in the divine love that gave birth to her. And so, through the Holy Spirit, she invites us to join the Trinitarian table. Which brings us back to our picture of the Trinity. You notice the eyes of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit on the right in green. Yes, the Spirit marvels at the relationship between God the Father and the Son, yet there's something strange about those eyes. They're looking down towards that odd little box on the front of the table. They're lovingly gazing at something else. Art historians examining the painting have determined that box contains glue residue. The prevailing theory is that once upon a time, a small mirror was attached to the painting. In other words, the Holy Spirit's loving gaze is directed at you. And the Holy Spirit invites you to the table so that you too can be part of the mutual adoration and love so wisdom can be birthed in you as well. Suddenly, faith is not about being able to explain that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods but one God. Rather, faith is about participating in the personal life of God. It is about sitting at the table of the divine feast. 
It is living in God's in-between and finding yourself caught up in divine love and your own belovedness. So like wisdom, you too are free to play in God's world and love the rest of creation. So what would happen if we took that picture and placed it here? at the altar. Can you see the Father positioned here? Looking lovingly at the Son. Reminding, reminded of everything Jesus has done to reveal divine love to the world. Can you see Jesus standing here And saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Take, drink. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin so that you might know that you too could be caught up in the love of the Trinity. Can you see the Holy Spirit standing here, looking at you and inviting you to the table so that you might partake in the divine feast, so you might get caught up in the belovedness that the Trinity shares with each other and for you, so that you might have wisdom birthed in you and find yourself free to play and frolic in a secure, stable world that your Father has blessed you with and love everything else in all of creation. Starting with the people in this room, but then everyone and everything you encounter once you walk out those doors. That is the power of Trinity Sunday. That is what we are invited to step into. So come to God's table and feast. A couple of quick announcement-y things before the blessing. Um, two potential stops on your way before you head out the doors and into the world to, to delight in all of the creation. One is those offering baskets that sit at the top of the stairs. Um, if you feel so moved to put something in those offering baskets, um, usually it'd be something financial, but if, I'm sure Peter would take a donation of coffee or something. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. your crypto. Oh, never mind, not your crypto. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there we go. You, please feel free to, 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 if you're so moved, to put something in those baskets to do so. And then, out the back doors on the back patio, um, meat and, and, and beyond meat and whatever hot dogs are, are cooking. And so feel free to Get some, some meat or some beyond meat or some whatever hot dogs are and, and enjoy and fellowship and enjoy one another. Um, and so what I want you to do now for me real quick is, is just close your eyes for a moment. And in your mind, I want you to picture the three persons of the Trinity. I want you to picture the love that they share between each other, the adoration. And I want you to imagine that it becomes this beautiful, radiant warmth. And at first you're just standing and admiring it because it looks so amazing. And then the Trinity reaches out the Spirit reaches out and takes your hand and invites you into the middle
Do you feel the love? Do you feel the radiant love, not just for each other, but for you? You are welcome at the divine table. You are so relentlessly beloved. Believe the gospel. Amen. Oh, and there's the prayer team's over here, so if you, if you need prayer, don't forget Ted.